All right. Hello and welcome to lecture three of this online ichthyology class. Uh, today we're going to get into anatomy. Specifically, we're going to talk about external anatomy, which is essentially the anatomy of the fish that you can see without opening it up, without cutting anything open. So these are the things that are visible on the outside of the fish. It includes things like scales, types of fins, mouths, all of those relevant things, which we might potentially talk about in more detail when we talk about the things they're relevant to. Like locomotion is very relevant to fins. Feeding is very relevant to the mouth. Um, gills are very relevant to respiration. Scales are particularly relevant to some interactions, some ecology. So we might talk about them more in depth, but for today we're going to get a general overview so that you can look at the outside of almost any fish and label the different parts of it. So the first thing to take a look at is the basics. So these are the things that you need to know in order to talk about a fish in general, to even talk about the things going on. So first of all, you need to know the sides of the fish, all right? So the top side is called the dorsal side, and the bottom side is called the ventral side, all right? The way that I've found best to remember this, of course, this is the kind of thing that by now is just in my head, but uh, you can remember dorsal like dorsal, like a sail fin on a boat, uh, because the dorsal fin is the fin on the top of the fish. So the dorsal side of the fish is the top of the fish. That's how I remember it. And then ventral is just the opposite of dorsal in my head. Maybe there's better ways to think of that. Anterior and posterior, I think, are a lot easier. I think pretty much everyone knows posterior means the back. So when you talk about posterior, you mean the back, which means if you hear anterior, you must know that that's the front. They all, all of the opposites have the same word ending. So anterior, posterior, and then dorsal, ventral, right? So you should be able to tell which matches with which, and then it's just to tell which side each one is on. So if you remember dorsal, and if you know that posterior is always the back, the post, the after, then that should be easy. And then the sections of the fish that are interesting to talk about that we need to use to divide the fish for talking about are the head, which is exactly what it sounds like, and the tail, which is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It is the, from the start here, uh, of the caudal peduncle, which is a part that we'll talk about, which is the connective part between the trunk and the tail. This is called the caudal peduncle, where my mouth is, mouse is, to the tail, is called the tail. And everything between is the trunk. It's like the main body, the body cavity. That's where you'll find uh, all of the organs most of the time. So these are the important things to talk about. Head, trunk, tail, you should be able to distinguish those just from looking at a fish. And the sides, the dorsal, ventral, anterior, posterior, should be easy. But it's not always as easy as you think because, like, one example is flatfish, flounder. Flounder lay on their side, okay, on the bottom of the ocean. They're flat and they lay on their side. And both of their eyes are on one side of their head. So is that top side where their eyes, the dorsal side, and then where they're laying down the ventral side? Well, no. Because they're normal fish so that just had their eye move over to the opposite side and then they laid down. So their dorsal side is still the top like if you held them like a normal fish. You held a flounder like this. The dorsal side's still here. The ventral side's still here. You've still got posterior anterior. They're just laying on their side. So their anatomy actually hasn't changed other than their eye moving over. They're just laying on their side. Um, so it can get a little bit complicated sometimes, but you should know the general directions and parts of a fish. So the first thing we're talking about is fins. They're the most, I'd say, externally obvious. If we look at, you know, just a random fish here, I think the most identifying feature is the fins. It would look a little bit weird without them. Hagfish. Um, so the first thing is the, er, the anatomy of just a fin in general. Um, fins can be made up of multiple different things, but the general idea is that there are membranes in between some kind of holder, okay? And that holder can either be a spine or a soft ray. And the difference between these, it's pretty obvious when you touch them, but just from sight, you should know that rays will branch off. You'll see how they branch off like trees here, whereas spines are always these hard, singular segments. And if you can feel a fish, specifically, you know, the, the fins of a fish, you'll recognize a spine. Trust me, uh, you'll get stabbed, you'll bleed, <laughs> and you'll go, oh, yep. That is a spine. Uh, so a lot of the most advanced fish will have their dorsal fin, their fin at the top, remember the dorsal, split into a spiny section and a soft section, a ray section, and we'll talk about that. But then a lot of other fish will have a singular spine at the beginning of a bunch of their fins on their body, uh, and that just serves as a protective measure. It can be used for a lot of different things. Okay, 
Uh, and then just one interesting little case study here. This is the fin of a sarcoterygy, which is a lobe-finned fish. Um, I can just move my camera out of the way for you here real quick. You'll see that there's actually bones in it, which sort of resemble finger bones. So unlike these fins that we're looking at here, which are just these uh, connective you know, tissue in between spines and rays, these are actually made up sort of like hands. There's bones and then there's a surrounding skin to them. Um, of course, it's it's still a fin, but it's interesting to look at that biology and see that like, oh, well, I know that those things are closely related to the tetrapodes that would eventually walk on land. So having these large bones in the hands seems to be one of the precursors to potentially walking on land. So now I've talked about all the types of fins because there's uh, a decent amount of fins on a fish. They all serve different purposes. We're not going to necessarily go into all the purposes today because they're relevant to specific things. Uh, dorsal and caudal fins are rel relative to locomotion, very useful in locomotion, uh, and other fins have other purposes. So today we're just going to learn how to identify which fins are which. Um, so dorsal, I've talked about, is the fin on the top of the fish. It will include all of these fins on the top of the fish except for this one here, which we'll talk about. So if there's a fin, on, a small fin on the caudal peduncle, remember that's the part that connects the tail to the trunk. If there's a small fin there, that is not a dorsal fin, but everything else on the top of the fish is a dorsal fin. Remember I said an advanced fish, it can be split into this spiny part and this soft part. So that's what we're looking at here. These are fin spines, and then there's fin soft rays. This is the spiny part. This is the soft part. Advanced fish will have their dorsal fin split. And in fact, how it's split, how low it goes, how many segments there are of the spiny part versus the soft part, the rayed part, is actually a good identifying feature for a lot of species. <clears throat> then we have the pelvic fins. Uh, the pelvic fins are generally on the bottom of the fish, on the pelvis. You can think of like your pelvis on your body and you know, equate that to the fish. Should be pretty obvious. And then the pectoral fin, which can you know, oftentimes be used for swimming direction changes, uh, is on, again, the pectorals, what you would expect. Just imagine, you know, pectoral versus pelvis on yourself, higher up versus lower. So your pelvic fins are going to be down on the stomach area of the fish, the lower side of the fish. Uh, and your pectoral fins are generally going to be higher up. Though the more advanced the fish, the higher the pectoral fins go. There are fish that have lower pectoral fins. Uh, that's more of a modern trait when you talk about modern versus ancestral. Uh, old, like, you know, ancestral fish will have their pelvic fins way back on the body. So these guys will come way back and their pectoral fins will come way down. Okay, And as fish advance, their pelvic fins move forward and their pectoral fins move up. So the most advanced fish you'll see will have pectoral fins like way up here along this gill cover here, which is called the operculum and their pelvic fins will actually be in front of their pectoral fins. Uh, and that's another good identifying feature when you're trying to identify fish. So just a brief look at dorsal fins. Um, dorsal fins are useful for a variety of things, mainly locomotion, uh, moving, but they're useful for a variety of things. But we're not going to go into super depth um, just because it's not necessarily necessary right now. Uh, when we talk about locomotion, we'll get into them more. But just to show you the diversity of dorsal fins, uh, when you talk about cod-like fish, you're talking about a triple dorsal fin. Okay, this is more of like a typical shark dorsal fin that you would see. Tuna have some very specialized dorsal fins to go really fast because that's what they're all about. Mola Mola, you can see this dorsal fin is way, way back. You know, it almost touches the caudal fin. Um, you've got some interesting ones on, you know, on the rays. Your dorsal fin, it looks more like spikes on the end of the tail. On a seahorse, it's on the back in this weird singular shape. So you can see they come in a variety of shapes and sizes. That's the main point that I wanted to make. Um, so then we're going to get to the last three fin types, and the last three fin types are anal, adipose, and caudal. Okay, so anal fin is pretty obvious. The anus is on the underside of the fish. Uh, it's like right here, and the anal fin will be right next to it. A pretty easy one to find. It's usually on the back side of the underside of the fish. So distinguishing this between the pelvic fin, which remember is up here, and the anal fin, this is an important distinguish since they're in the same area. 
Um, the pelvic fin will, will be the one that's further forward. The anal fin will be the one that's further back. The anal fin will be right along the anus, which you should be able to see. And the pelvic fin will be not right along. It will be further up. Uh, also, pelvic fins tend to be used for like direction. So they're going to be like these small, thinner. They'll resemble pectoral fins more, like what you think of typical fins. Anal fins will tend to be like larger, more spread out. Um, so this is a good example in all of those cases. Uh, then you have the adipose fin, and this isn't actually a fin at all. It doesn't have the fin structures. Uh, it's just an extra little segment that is on the caudal peduncle of some fish. Not all fish have it, um, but it, just to be clear, it is not a true fin. I actually had to draw it onto this diagram because this diagram didn't have it, but it's important to know because you might see it and think, oh, that must be part of the dorsal or part of the caudal. It's not a true fin. It does not have the fin structure. It is just an extra little segment that tends to help with swimming, with locomotion, with making things more efficient, keeping the body, the water running along the body as the fish swims. Um, so then you have the caudal fin, which should be the obvious one. This is called the tail fin or the caudal fin. Uh, not many people say tail fin, but you can if you'd like. Uh, and this, there's a lot of variation here in caudal fins. Anal fins aren't going to vary that much. Pelvic, pectoral aren't going to vary that much. Dorsal fins do have good variants. Um, we looked at some examples of that, but caudal fins, it's actually worth looking at the different variants within the, within the fish. So these are just some of the, the caudal fins that you can potentially have. Uh, so the first type is rounded. This is like a goby type tail. A lot of gobies will have this type tail. So you can have a rounded homocircle, meaning a member, I've told you this phrase before, it's the same top to bottom, or rounded heterocircle, where it's not the same top to bottom. Then you can have a truncate tail fin, which is just this flat edge to the tail. So whereas this one will be rounded along it, this one will be flat on the edge. Uh, sometimes you'll call things truncate even if they're slightly curved in. But generally the definition of truncate is that it is a flat, flat edge here. So if it's slightly curved in, this is what you would start to call emarginate. Uh, and emarginate, move my camera over. Uh, is this mildly indented or concave fin. And they can actually be multiple emarginate. So it can be indented multiple times along the tail fin, and you would still call that emarginate. You can call it double emarginate, triple emarginate, depending on how advanced the fin is. Uh, but you still call it emarginate once it starts to have a divot in it. Uh, keep in mind, all of these caudal fins are on sort of a spectrum, right? Like rounded is pretty obvious. A straight up truncate is pretty obvious. But the next three, which is emarginate, and then the next two, forked and lunate, are somewhat subjective. There's not like a clear measurement definition, so it's kind of just what the tail looks like to you, the tail fin looks like to you. Because the difference between emarginate and forked is that forked is just slightly more indented than emarginate is. And the difference between forked and lunate is it's even slightly more indented than the forked tail is. Uh, and you'll see they're on a spectrum. You would consider this lightly forked. This is unevenly forked, you know, just a slightly more deeply forked. This is deeply forked, but also could be called lunate. And then this is lunate. So I would say that this is pretty obviously forked and this is pretty obviously lunate, but everything in between uh, could potentially be up for debate. You could call this lunate and I, I wouldn't necessarily say that you're wrong. And you could call this forked and I wouldn't necessarily say that you're wrong. Uh, so just understand that everything here is on a spectrum from rounded to lunate. Uh, rounded and truncate should be fairly clear, but emarginate to lunate in particular, I think can have a lot of variance. And so I think it's not necessarily important to know the exact thing, but it is important to know the general shape. And we'll talk about what advantages the different shapes have uh, when we get to locomotion, because that's what they're mainly used for. You know, some of them are quieter, some of them are louder, some of them allow more propulsion, some of them allow longer distance swimming. They all serve different purposes. <coughs> So then we'll talk about mouths. Mouths are another obvious feature that's uh, obvious from the outside of the fish. And the three types of mouths that we look at are inferior, terminal, and superior. Now to be clear, inferior and superior in this context do not mean that one is better than the other. Uh, we use the word that way, but superior just means on top and inferior means below. So we use the word because we say superior people are on top and inferior people are below those people. But it just means on top and below. So when we're talking about the mouth and we talk about an inferior mouth, it might help you remember inferior is below. Inferior is a mouth that points downwards. 
their inferior mouths that are straight downwards, like suckers will have these mouths straight up on the bottom. And then there's inferior mouths where it will just point slightly downwards. There's a variety. And inferior mouths are just mouths that point downwards. Uh, we'll, when we get to feeding, we'll talk about the various mouths and what they're useful for, and we'll look at examples. But just for now, the general overview is inferior mouths are going to eat things below them. Basically, wherever your mouth is pointed is where you're trying to get food. So inferior mouths tend to swim t uh, along the bottom and pick up like, you know, cephalopods and things that are on the bottom that they can grab. Okay, this is a common thing in sharks. It's common in a lot of different fish. There's explanations here. Sharks, skates, rays, and bottom feeding fishes. Does it make sense? If you're going to eat things below you, if you're going to be swimming along the bottom, eating things on the bottom, you're going to want a mouth that points downwards towards the bottom. The next mouth is terminal, uh, and there's what's called terminal and subterminal. Terminal just means that it comes straight out, essentially, is the idea. And subterminal will mean that it comes straight out, but like slightly below the middle. Um, so you'll see that like this is still terminal. The mouth section is still out, but it is slightly below the snout. And this one even points slightly, slightly down. You can make an argument for this being inferior, but it's just that the upper jaw extends further than the lower jaw. That's the important feature. Does the jaw as a whole, the upper and lower jaw, point downwards, point upwards, or does it point straight out but one end of it extends further? If one end of it extends further but the jaw is still even, it's a terminal mouth. Uh, and this is common in a couple of things. This one's showing gar and billyfish, but there's a lot of fish with this, this type of terminal mouth. It's a pretty common thing. It's used for like ram feeding, for filter feeding, for a variety of things where you're trying to catch a thing in front of you. If you're trying to chase down prey, you need to have a mouth that is in front of you so that you can swim up behind it and eat it. And then there's superior mouths. Um, these are the kind of mouths that you'll see in largemouth bass and muskies. Uh, the most extreme examples you'll see are in like arowanas and arapaimas uh, because they will sit on the surface and eat things above them. Or another use of this superior or upturned mouth is and this is where we get the full range of the ecosystem because the inferior mouths are sweeping along the bottom the terminal mouths are in the middle you know they are open water fish and then the superior mouths you would expect at the surface to eat the things above them like arapaimas and arowanas have been seen eating birds but then you go all the way back down because now the fish that are laying in the sand, like stargazers and monkfish, which are eating things that swim by as they're buried in the sand, those also will have superior mouths because they want to eat things above them. So you've got this cycle where the superior mouths are at the top, the superior mouths are at the bottom, the inferior mouths are slightly over, and the terminal and subterminal mouths are going to be in the middle water layer. So you should now be able to see a mouth and identify it. You should now be able to see a fin and identify it. And if it's a tail fin, you should be able to give me a definition of the tail fin. So next thing we need to look at is skin and scales. This is debatable whether it's uh, interior or exterior uh, when you talk about anatomy, but at the very least, scales are exterior. Uh, and it's important to talk about what scales are layered into, you know, what they're set into. So when everything above lampreys so lampreys and above in far as the you know ancestral order of fish so when you talk about everything that's after lampreys so basically everything except hagfish uh, skin is layered uh, which means that there are multiple layers to the skin uh, generally on top is dead skin and below is you know new growing skin it's the same on humans our top layer of skin is dead if you didn't know that you are covered in uh, a shell of dead skin right now and that's the protective layer because dead skin can't diffuse dead skin doesn't have live cells that are going to take in water or take in a substance or something like that so they act as a really good barrier okay so the under layer of skin in fish is called the stratum gernatium all right don't really know need to know that stratum is just you know that layer the german layer pretty obvious the outer layer is called the stratum corneum and that's dead cells so the lower layer will create new cells which then rise up to the outer layer the outer layer is filled with dead cells. So the outer layer of skin, okay, the stratum gernatium, is not actually growing. It's not even really alive. It's all dead cells okay, that are made below and then brought up. So the outside layer of skin is dead, is the important note from that. And the scales are actually going to be embedded at a single point. That's important to note. 
uh, are embedded at a single point into this epidermis layer. So the layers that I'm talking about are right here in this epidermis. I'm not talking about anything below this. This is not important right now. That's more of internal anatomy. <clears throat> so the epidermis is this very thin layer that will have those two layers that I talked about, the dead skin and the newly produced skin, the dead cells and the newly produced cells, and the scales are embedded into that. Okay, and there's a lot of different types of scales. So the general types of scales are cosmoid, ganoid, placoid, and leptoid. All right. So cosmoid are an ancestral fish type of scale. Uh, they're in the lungfish and the coelacanths, aka the sarcoterygi. Uh, you should remember sarcoterygi. I should start being able to use Latin names, and you should know what I'm talking about. Um, they're derived from fused placoid scales, which we'll talk about. Uh, and they grow when the bone underneath them grows. So the scales themselves don't grow. This is a good distinguishing feature if you can find it between scales. Do the scales themselves grow? Do the bone below the scales grow? Do the scales not grow at all? That's the distinguishing feature. So cosmoid scales, the bone beneath will grow, not the actual surface of the scale. Then we've got ganoid scales. Uh, which are in sturgeons, gars, bishers, etc. The edges are serrated and they're covered in dentine and they grow with the fish. So these scales will grow as the fish grows completely normally. <clears throat> and then we've got placoid scales, which is in the chondrichthys. So these are the sharks, skates, rays, um, and the holocephaly. And they're homologous to teeth. So they're actually from, derived from the same structure as teeth. And that's why the sides of sharks if you rub them the wrong way tend to be really sharp and it can actually really hurt to rub your hand along a shark in the wrong direction because they're actually derived from teeth uh, they don't grow so as a shark gets older it'll actually just fill in more scales the scales that are already there are not growing uh, just more scales are getting filled in and all of these scales we've talked about so far are tiled okay meaning that the scales don't overlap scales are in place and this is pretty obvious if you look at like a lungfish or a coelacanth um, or a variety of other fish you'll see that the scales each have their like perfect edges and they meet the next scale at the perfect edge and it's a nice pattern and then you get to more modern fishes and you have leptoid scales and leptoid scales do overlap uh, they have outer bony ridges um, and they they overlap like i said and they evolved from these ganoid scales so that should be pretty obvious uh, if you're going to look at the various scales and say which one most resembles with the outer bony ridge. Uh, and within leptoid, we have two different types of scales in the modern fish, which is cycloid and antenoid. Uh, cycloid is just they're very smooth. They're very uniform. That outer edge is not sharp. It's not ridged. These are in carp. These are in salmon. These are a lot of the common uh, scales that you'll see on common fish. Just that circular edge with an overlapping scale. You can pretty much assume that it's leptoid and that it's cycloid. Tenoid is similar, you know, they're made in the same structure, but they have small serration on the outer edges. Uh, so you can see, this is a very zoomed in picture of a very small scale, but you'll see that there's slight points, slight serration on the edge of the scale. And you could be able to feel that if you were able to feel the fish, and you should also be able to visually, if you look close enough uh, at any decent size of fish, be able to see that. And they're found generally in fish that have spiny fin rays. So remember how we talked about there's spines potentially in the dorsal fin sometimes of fish? Well, sometimes there's spines at the beginning of other fins. There can be spines at the beginning of the anal fin and the pectoral fin and the pelvic fin. Uh, and fish that tend to have those, those spines in the beginning of their fin rays, uh, will also tend to have tenoid scales. But that's not necessarily a rule by any means. Uh, the one rule you should know for ichthyology is that there's always exceptions. Or maybe that's the rule for life in general, but there's always exceptions. So here's some interesting scale modifications before we move on. Uh, scales have been modified to do a lot of things, especially throughout history. You'll see that scales are actually like the evolutionary precursor to a lot of structures that we have, that humans have, that other things have. Um, but within fish... Uh, they've been modified into scutes, which are basically a type of scale that is modified specifically for locomotion. It allows better hydrodynamics. So tuna will actually have scutes along their caudal peduncle here. Remember, that's the part that the trunk connects to the tail, the caudal peduncle here, which allows them to move through water even more efficiently than they already do. Uh, you'll start to realize why tuna are so fast when we talk about locomotion. They've got some crazy adaptations. Uh, then we've got scutes on sturgeons which sort of serve as sort of a protective armor because they're pretty big but they also serve hydrodynamically um there are armored catfish 
uh, that will have these scoots actually, or these their scales actually modified to serve as armor. So they're hard and they're locked together in sort of an overlapping pattern that you don't normally see in fish, and it makes it hard for them to get bit through. And then you'll see some crazy things like in seahorses where the scales have actually segmented into these bony plates. And these bony plates are very obvious. If you ever held a seahorse, even like a, one that's been dead for a while, they don't really decay because the outside of the seahorse is almost entirely made of these bony plates, which are derived from scales. So those are interesting things that scales have done over time. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at uh, just all of the general groups of fish, and we're just going to see, now that we have all of this knowledge that we've just come up with, if we can identify the various things. Okay, so on in Athens, on hagfish, you're not going to see very much of what we talked about. Okay, sure, you might see sensory tentacles. Um, that's a hagfish thing. You see this median fin, this unlabeled back fin, right? And you'll see these slime glands that we talked about when we talked about hagfish. But you'll notice basically all of the uh, external anatomy of a fish that we discussed and that we learned about, you're not going to find on a hagfish. Once you get to a lamprey, though, you're starting to get noticeable things. So you've got this mouth. Uh, this is a mouth. Remember, we would call this mouth inferior. It's pointing downwards. Okay, you can see their gill slits, which will go into their gill. We talked about on you know most modern fish, they have that gill cover, the operculum. Um, but some of the more ancestral fish just have openings. The hagfish have this as well. So now we look at dorsal fin. So there's an anterior and a posterior dorsal fin on lampreys, but there is, these are both dorsal fins. Remember I said anything on the top that is a fin structure will be a dorsal fin. And the dorsal fin in this fish is actually connected to the caudal fin. So the caudal fin and the dorsal fin and the posterior dorsal fin at the very least are connected. Uh, and that's important and that'll happen sometimes in eels as well and it'll also actually connect with the anal fin. We'll talk about that. But you should know that these are both dorsal fins because these are both clearly fin structures. So you should, you should have known that, and you should be able to know that also this is the head. Oh, this is the head up until the gills. This is the trunk, and then that's the tail. Then we look at skates and rays, and this is the where it gets a little bit complicated because skates and rays are just very different from, from most fish, but when you lay out what they actually are, it becomes a little bit more obvious. So these rays, you know, these outside things, are just pectoral fins, okay? So this is a normal fish. Ignore, say, ignore these side things. Just pretend that the rays aren't there. You know, the side, the wings, if you want to call them that, aren't there. And it looks somewhat like a normal fish. So these are basically just very large uh, pectoral fins, okay? So when you keep that in mind, it becomes a little bit more obvious. The pelvic fins are down here, all right? And then you've got dorsal fins on the skates, mainly, which tend to be on the end of the tail. Uh, the difference between skates and rays is a little bit complicated, but the general idea you should be able to see from the tail. Rays are going to have stingers on the tail, skates won't, stuff like that. Then we get to the chondrichthys, we get to the sharks, and now we're looking at like modern identifiable fish, and we should start to be able to see all of the various things uh, that we know on the fish. So you'll actually, if we look at the dorsal fin here, the first dorsal fin, you'll see a spine. So there's a dorsal spine here. Uh, that starts and then that means the rest of this is rays in the in the fin um we should know because this is a shark it's a chondric these the type of scales it has has placoid scales remember that are derived from teeth um, we can see the gill openings these guys do not have gill covers they are not the highly advanced fish they just have slits that water will flow into towards the gills here we have the pectoral fin right behind the gills which is pretty typical but you see it's not very high up on the fish, like on the highly advanced fish. I talked about the pectoral fins go up, and then the other thing was the pelvic fins go forward. And you'll notice how far back the pelvic fin is here. The pelvic fin and the anal fin are basically right next to each other. You know, they're very close to each other. Um, so pelvic fin coming up is, you know, more of a modern thing. This is more ancestral, because you should know when we went through that whole taxonomy in the last lecture that we talked about chondrichthys pretty early on. The, the cartilaginous fish are pretty early in the evolutionary history, and that should be obvious when you look, oh, the pectoral fin's way down here, oh, the pelvic fin's way back here, that must be an ancestral fish. Then you've got claspers, uh, which are a, a organ used for mating, similar to a penis, but not exactly the same thing, and um, 
we'll talk about those when we get to you know reproduction and mating it's not particularly important right now but on a shark they're obvious on the outside other fish won't have them uh, but on sharks they're uh, they're obvious on the outside this is the anal fin remember it'll be next to the anus it'll always be behind the pelvic fin so in this fish you might have been confused like oh well, which one's the pelvic which one's the anal because they're both towards the back remember the further forward one will be the pelvic fin the further back one will be the anal fin this fish tends to have a second dorsal fin and you'll notice that there's no adipose fin here sharks don't necessarily often have adipose fins so we're missing that one but then we get to the caudal fin and we should recognize here this is the caudal peduncle they call it i guess the pre-caudal pit or the caudal keel but it's the caudal peduncle uh, it's the part that connects the trunk of the fish remember the main part of the fish to the tail and you'll notice that this tail here this tail fin is actually hetero circle remember the it is uneven top to bottom the top is longer and you'll notice that the top section of the tail is actually an extension of the body whereas the bottom of the section of the tail is just fin rays so that's an important distinction is that this is actually an extension of the body whereas this is fin rays coming out this way uh, that tends to be a very distinguishing feature of sharks is that the the caudal fin on the upward side will be part of the body and on the bottom side will have fin rays uh, we can look at the holocephaly, the other chondrichthians, which are chimeras. You won't notice a ton of differences, but there's some interesting things to look at. This gill opening, rather than those gill slits that you're used to seeing, these guys actually have an operculum. It's called a soft operculum, so it's not the same like hard gill cover that you expect uh, on a on a advanced fish, but it's there. You'll notice this mouth. Uh, that's one thing I forgot to point out. You'll notice this mouth on this fish looks pretty terminal. Uh, that's something you should always look at mouths now and try to remember which one is which. Uh, you'll notice this mouth looks slightly subterminal to me. Um, you'll notice the pectoral fin is very large. The pelvic fin is actually further up on the holocephaly than it was on the shark, but not to the degree of you know modern fishes that we were looking up where the pelvic fins were way in front of the pectoral fins. Uh, you'll notice the dorsal fin. You've got the spine. And then the second dorsal fin here is very weird. So you've got a first dorsal fin that looks pretty typical of a shark, and then the second long, like, eel-like dorsal fin. Then you've got this really weird caudal fin, which is attached to this tail of the fish that's going way out past the caudal fin. So the actual fish, this is very rare in fish, is actually extending past the caudal fin. Usually the caudal fin completely engulfs the end of the fish, the tail of the fish. Uh, but in holocephaly, it does not. The tail's going to go out further. These guys also have claspers. Keep in mind they are closely related. And the anal fin should be obvious because we've got the pelvic fin here and the caudal fin here. It's in between them. Uh, then we look at some of the osteichthys, the bony fish. The first one is the lung fish. Uh, this is where you should see some like obvious examples of the scales here. should be pretty easy to look at these scales and say, oh, yes, I know what type of scale these are. Um, so you've got the eye, the mouth, the nostril, all the typical things that don't really need explanations right now. The operculum covering the gills. That is the purpose of the operculum. Uh, and then we're going to see the lateral line. Now, the lateral line is present in most fish, uh, but this is the first time where we'll see it very obviously. And the lateral line's purpose is it's basically a bunch of pores on the side of the fish that can sense things like vibrations uh, and pressure changes in the water. And the lateral line, we'll talk about it when we talk about internal anatomy because most of what happens with it is inside the fish. Um, but on the outside, you can often see this line down the side of the fish. Uh, and this is pressure sensitive and vibration sensitive and allows them to tell what's going on around them even when they can't necessarily see. So some fish who are actually completely blind, like naked gobies, will have very, very sensitive lateral lines to sense what's going on around them. Uh, schooling fish tend to have really good lateral lines because they need to know where all of the other fish around them are, even in the dark. Because if you leave your school, you're going to get picked off by a predator. The whole point of a school of fish is strength in numbers, right? So if you lose your strength in numbers, you're kind of screwed. So being able to sense where everything is without having to constantly look around and go, oh, where's my buddy? Where's my buddy? Where's my buddy? You know, being able to just sense, okay, he's here, he's here. I need to stay here. Uh, the lateral line is very useful for that. It can also help detect predators, large movements, things like that. And remember, it's in most fish, but this is where you start seeing it, obviously, and I'll point it out as we see it more. Uh, so on these lungfish, remember I talked about these pectoral and pelvic fins are very weird, these long and stringy fins, um, but they are still, this is still obviously pectoral fins, it's coming from behind the operculum. These are still obviously pectoral fins, it's coming from the bottom of the fish. And this is where we'll see our first example of connected 
dorsal caudal anal fin. And you might initially look at this if it wasn't labeled and assume that this is one fin. Like this is the caudal fin and it just extends really far on the tail. So it's important to note that this is actually the dorsal fin, the anal fin, and the caudal fin. They're just connected. It's three different fins, but they're connected. This is not only a caudal fin that is extending on the tail here. Okay. Uh, then we'll look at this other type of lungfish. Fairly similar. You know, you've got the pectoral fin, it should be obvious, the pelvic fin should be obvious, and then once again, the anal fin, the caudal fin, and the dorsal fin are all going to connect into one. Uh, and in this type of fish, I believe it's the Queensland lungfish, is, has overlapping cycloid scales. So this should be pretty obvious. Remember I talked about scales that overlap. Well, it's going to be leptoid when they overlap, and then our two options are tenoid and cycloid. And this looks more cicular than it does rough serrated edge to me. So I would have guessed overlapping cycloid scales, and I would have been right. Then we've got the eels. Uh, the eels are pretty unique in a similar way. You've got this lateral line. Their anatomy is pretty simple from the outside, not as simple from the inside. Uh, you've got these, these little gill slits, little gill holes. The pectoral fin should be pretty obvious. Um, and then you've got the dorsal fin, the caudal fin, and the anal fin all combined into one once again. A lot of people make the mistake of thinking that this is one big tail fin. And it's important to know that it is not. It is three different structures that have just grown together. Uh, they're indistinguishable at this point, but they are separate structures. Then we'll look at catfish. So catfish have their unique trait is these barbels, which they can use to sense, to like basically feelers, which they have out to touch things and sense what's going on. But otherwise, they're a fairly normal fish, except catfish tend to have the most pronounced adipose fins. So remember, we talked about these fins that don't have fin structures in them, right, that are just there for a little bit of help with locomotion. Catfish tend to have the most prominent adipose fins. Um, so you'll see this big, big fin here that doesn't have a fin structure, but clearly resembles a fin if you were just to look at it from, you know, look at it quickly. Uh, you'll see the dorsal fin, should be obvious. See this forked, remember the types of tail fins, this forked caudal fin. This one actually is the caudal peduncle labeled. You'll see this anal fin, pelvic fin, pectoral fin, and you can actually start to see that the pelvic fin is coming closer to the pectoral fin. So we're tar starting to get to more modern fishes. And if you remember the taxonomy, the catfish, the osteriophysi, were somewhere towards the middle. So we're starting to get towards the more modern fishes, and that's why we're seeing the pelvic fin move forward here. Um, and the pectoral fin be right behind. This would be the operculum. It's not labeled, but you should know that now. And then the final thing we'll look at is just a random euteliost. This is a type of sunfish, common sunfish. Um, this is just going to serve as an example for us of all the modern um, bony fish, like the highly advanced ones. Uh, and you'll notice the pectoral fin is right here, and the pelvic fin is almost exactly right below it. There will be fish where the pelvic fin is in front of the pectoral fin. Um, but here you'll see in the sunfish, it's almost exactly right below it. You've got this operculum. This operculum actually has like a flap on it, and this is covering the gills, and this is hard. This is rough if you were to try and feel it. You'll notice that the dorsal fin is split, like we talked about in one of the first slides, into these spiny dorsal fins and these soft rays. It's an identifying feature if you're able to count them. So these guys, remember, soft rays will split it, will segment along the way, and spiny will be hard along the way, spiny exactly as they sound. You'll see the caudal peduncle, which is actually pretty long on the sunfish, which connects the trunk, this main area in the middle, the trunk, to the tail. See this caudal fin? I would call it emarginate. You could call it maybe slightly forked if you'd like. I would call this tail emarginate. The lateral line, you'll see here, it's not always a straight line along the fish because sometimes if you have you know, an ear flap or a pectoral fin here that's kind of big, and tends to flap, if you're trying to sense vibrations in the water and your fin's moving right in front of it, you're only going to feel the vibrations and the pressure changes from your fin moving. So sometimes lateral lines will curve up above the pectoral fin so that you're not sensing that. It should be pretty obvious, like if you're trying to listen to something far away and you put a speaker playing music right in front of your ear, it's going to be kind of difficult to hear the thing far away. So you don't want to have your pectoral fin moving right in front of your lateral line because you're losing some of the usefulness of it. So the lateral line moves up on some of these fish and will be above and it'll be slightly curved. And it can even go all the way up like above the head. Uh, lateral lines are pretty interesting. It can even cover the head in some way. The pores can spread out a lot. Uh, you'll notice the terminal mouth. You might say slightly subterminal. I would say terminal. 
Uh, you'll notice the anal fin and a key unique feature of sunfish here is that the anal fin has these three spines and then it'll be rays. So it's actually segmented just like the dorsal fin with spines and then rays, except it's specifically three spines that then have rays. And remember, the dorsal side, the ventral side, the anterior, and the posterior. And if you were able to identify all the various parts of this fish, uh, I think you are now qualified to talk about the external anatomy of a fish. You should be able to look at basically any fish and describe its various fins, describe its gill, describe its mouth, describe its its tail fin, talk about the, you know, the ventral, the dorsal, the anterior, and the posterior. And that is the goal of today. Uh, next lecture, we will talk about the internal anatomy, which is going to be significantly more complicated because we're going to talk about the musculature, we're going to talk about the skeletal system, uh, and we're going to talk about all of the organs, and potentially, though I haven't decided yet, might talk about the skin in more depth. Um, so I hope you're looking forward to that because that's going to be the deep, deep learning. But once we're past anatomy, once we have anatomy and taxonomy under us, we can talk about anything because we know everything about the fish outside and inside and we know everything about the fish as far as identifying it. Uh, and then we can move on to talk about all the interesting behaviors and the feeding and the locomotion and the reproduction and all those interesting things with the context of being able to understand the fish. I hope you enjoyed and I will see you next time.